<laughs> From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And joining me tonight from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How's how's the weather down there in Charleston? Yesterday we had Chamber of Commerce weather. It was seventy-five degrees, and uh, we had a little rain at the end of the afternoon. But otherwise, it was spectacular. The dogwoods are blooming, the azaleas are blooming, and today it was fifty degrees, and got a high yeah. of about sixty-six. So. It's springtime in Charleston. The pollen is everywhere. And as you can hear, I'm a little bit nasally. And last week I had one of Vincent's viruses that gave me acute viral laryngitis. <laughs> well, this morning the bird bath was frozen here. So it went really below freezing. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. That's incredible. It's starting to warm up. Um, but um, it's fine. I don't really mind. So welcome everybody to... Uh, Another office hours. Uh, I want to thank our moderators before we move on. Steph, Steph, Barb Mac UK, Andrew, uh, Tom is here, and also uh, PDK. Thank you all for moderating tonight. And thank you all others for joining us. Uh, people will be coming in over the next 20 minutes or so. And get your... Um, microbiology questions queued up vanity nutrition is here okay welcome um viral files so last week michael they told us the viral file is someone who wants to have sex with a virus really i thought they just meant they ate them or loved them well that's how i used it and apparently yes. so then we made virology files but uh oh. i don't know i like viral files i don't think everyone looks at it with that meaning okay but first of all no. I don't know if it's not physically possible to do that unless no. you, hey, you know what could be if you, if you allow a virus to insert into your genome, that could be a kind of sex, right? Recombination. Yes. Yeah, that's what we call yes. recombination among viruses, viral yes. sex. So that's not bad. Anyway, Michael Schmidt is, of course, um, from this week in microbiology. He was there from the start, right? You came in on the Absolutely. first episode. We were there at episode number one all those years ago. It was in the previous decade. Good grief. It was in the 1990s. We're, we're not, the, we haven't hit the numbers that uh, TWIV has hit. And the paper I picked for tomorrow's TWIM actually talks about another pandemic, except this one occurred in 1347. We're going to talk about plague tomorrow. Plague is always yeah. interesting. Yeah. Plague, plague is an absolutely fascinating topic, and uh, as some of you know, this is the 70th anniversary month of our uh. description of DNA. Watson and Crick described the oh. DNA double helix back in March of 1953, and look at far we have come in those 70 years. Back in 1953, we didn't even know DNA was the molecule that conferred inheritance. I mean, there was still a great debate going on whether or not it was protein or whether or not it was DNA or even RNA. Yeah, and I just so, I just gave the the Avery McLeod McCarty paper in one of my classes and um I said, you know, this was pretty convincing, but still a lot of people didn't buy it. They said, oh, you have oh. contamination in your DNA. It was protein contaminating. And the poor guy died before he could get a Nobel Prize. Yeah. <clears throat> and they and those centrifuges that they did those experiments in, I don't think they even exist any longer. <laughs> you know, they, they literally had telescopes that you would look through and see the bands forming at the right spot. Here we when go. I was episode one, Michael Twim, yes, February twenty third, twenty eleven, yes, it was me and you, Cliff Mintz and Stan Malloy. Yes, we had Stanley in the beginning. Yeah, that was fun, and then Stan Stan didn't stay on, and we had Ron no. Atlas, we had Margaret McFull Nye, we had Joe Handelsman, and then and she went yeah. off to the White House on us. Went to the White House. That's right. And has not come back. Um, 
so Michael, you have a PhD, right? I do indeed from Indiana University in did you beautiful work with, Bloomington. Did, did you know Carl Woes? No, Carl was at University of Illinois, but I knew okay. his disciple, Norm Pace, really Norm Pace, well. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Pace. Um, I remember discussing 16S RNA with Norm uh, in seminar, and um, I was actually on the recruiting team uh, at Indiana. Graduate students got to sit on faculty recruitment committees. Uh, to to effectively learn the ropes. And I was on the committee that recruited Norm Pace back to Indiana University. Uh, mm -hmm. He had he had been on sabbatical in Carl Woese's lab at the University of Illinois. And my major professor, Walter Kanetska, uh, snuck over to Urbana <laughs> one weekend and uh, Walt had a special relationship with Norm in that Norm Pace did undergraduate research and Walt Konetska and uh, Dean Frazier, who is a virologist in Indiana, Dean mm. Frazier uh, and Norm did uh, undergraduate virology research and Dean Frazier's lab. And he wow. worked on, uh, I think MS2, but my neurons may be going on me. And so uh, Norm came over and uh, we had a long conversation about the dielectric constant of water because he was working on extreme thermophiles. I mm -hmm. remember sitting in a conference room eating lunch with a bunch of other graduate students, and we were asking him, how do you grow bacteria at, you know, 250 degrees C? He says, lots of pressure. <laughs> and uh, it was absolutely fascinating. And cool. I got to know him pretty well over the remaining years I was a PhD student. And you know, have stayed in touch with him. And of course, Norm then recruited a postdoc with my last name uh, by the name of Tom Schmidt, mm -hmm. who is now a colleague of Michelle Swanson at Michigan. So what did you do your thesis on? I worked on uh, selenium transport. Mm -hmm. um, my major professor, Walt Konetska, was into um, looking at novel bacterial processes and selenium is an essential trace element. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out, did it just steal its way into the cell with sulfur or was there a specific transport mechanism for selenite, which is not the most um, oxidized form of the element. It's one below. And uh, so you can bring it in and the bacteria like to dump waste electrons into selenium and they turn it into uh, metal. They turn it into the literally the pigment of fire engines. It, it becomes fire huh. engine red. It's right <laughs> below sulfur in the periodic table and below selenium in the periodic table is tellurium. And many clinical microbiologists are familiar with telluride agar because mm -hmm. we use that as a selective and differential media for the selection of crinibacteria. bacteria. Wow. That's so, so cool. um, and it turns a very deep, dark uh, color. So I got fascinated with metals. And of course, many of you who listen to TWIM know that I've been working with copper these past years, uh, looking at the antimicrobial properties of copper. And what yeah. we were fundamentally trying to understand is how to, um, even back in the early 80s when we were working on selenium transport, we were trying to understand how we could get uh, selenium out of uh, uh, the bad water that's out west. Many of the soils out west are seleniferous. They have high concentrations of selenium. And when you see those old John Wayne movies, you, you hear about, don't let the cattle drink that water. And they're worried about the selenium because then huh. the cows get something called the blind staggers and huh. they oh literally get selenium intoxicated. And um, the way we detoxify it is we add methyl groups. But I learned a lot. The way the bacteria deal with excess selenium concentrations is they upregulate their glutathione levels. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of my first papers, selecting for glutathione up mutants. And cool. bacteria don't like to have a lot of reduced glutathione around. Uh, it's bad for them. And so they're very stingy with upregulating it. And so 
I learned a bit yeah. of genetics and a cool. lot of microbial physiology. So it was a really interesting time Michael, at IU. Look who's, look who's here, Michael. Who's here? Let me see if I can move you my screen. Be, you should be able to see the comments when I select Mark them. Martin's come Hello. to office hours. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Mark. Look at how excited you got, Michael. Isn't that cool? <laughs> Hello, well, Mark. You know, I, I look at Mark's poor office hours and no one ever goes to Mark's office hours, according <laughs> to his Facebook page, which I find actually hard to believe. Here, Mark sent me this uh, little plastic molded 3d moldy do you know who this is uh, michael do you have any idea who this i is? have no idea well he's he was a science fiction writer okay many years ago and it's his not name the is, robot it's not i robot it's not asimov no, it, is it no it's hp lovecraft okay and uh mark sent me this because he knew i'm a fan <laughs> anyway we have some people here who okay. uh, know about selenium peter says selenium is big in new zealand because of all the sheep absolutely the sheep are you know that that was one of the things and and walt was really big on uh, using microbes to help bioremediate and and begin to look at all of these uh, mm. interesting phenomena and uh, it was a uh, you know i walked into the lab and i was his last phd student and he says pick a project any project and uh, his philosophy in training graduate students was uh, it glows in the dark. Glows in the dark. How about that? <laughs> it's not very charged up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So Walt's um, philosophy of training graduate students is you put them in a lab. Yeah. You give them all the supplies they need and you let them stumble around. And eventually they find their way out. And they've learned a lot. They have learned how to do science properly with controls. And you bring data into his office and he would say, uh, um, what's missing here? And um, typically in the early days, it was a control. And then as you got better at designing your experiments, the data would then bother him because you couldn't explain all the data. So that sent you back to the bench to design the next better experiment so you would get a binary answer rather than the maybes the maybe answers in experiments answer rather than the maybes the maybe answers in experiments are always bad so so mark mark wants ex extra credit maybe you'd like to join me on an office hours sometime mark okay because you're behind you're you're behind three hours so it's not so bad for you to do this uh, so uh, Alton Meister was the original glutathione king. Is that right, Michael? Yes. Wow. Didn't know that. And uh, Barb Max says selenium is essential for conversion of thyroxine to T3. That's how I know yep. about it. Very cool. And Vanity says a little goes a long way with selenium. When nutritionally, one Brazil nut fulfills your daily requirement. All, all of these things and more I knew about selenium. Uh, one Halloween, I dressed up as Captain Selenium. Oh, my uh, they gosh. Used to make fun, they used to make fun of me. I had a cape and everything. That's very funny. Um, here's, uh, here, here's some people you met. So uh, Kip and Laura, you met at the fundraiser last year. I did uh, indeed. San Francisco. So thank you, Kip and Laura, for your support of... Uh, science communication and also rob thank you rob is a big a big fungus fan and he always says clever things so come up with something clever rod uh, rob sorry that it will impress michael okay <laughs> well what what fungi do with selenium is they make methyl selenide which is volatile and it goes off as a gas so the fungi are really clever about wow. dealing with selenium so let me show you where people are from here, Michael. So we have Liz from uh, Columbus. Uh, Barb Mack, of course, is from the UK. I happen to know Noir is from Santa Fe. Claire is from the UK. Uh, let's see, another Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania. Let's see, let's get more exotic. Here we go, uh, Colorado. That's, that's not bad. What else do we have here? Ontario, Canada. We got Italy. <laughs> it's a little rainy in Italy. It's also probably pretty late. We got uh, New Zealand here. Uh, uh, let's see, Toronto, Houston, Texas. We got Eastern Massachusetts. 
Uh, where else do we have here? San Jose, California, Portland, Oregon, Tucson, Arizona, Spain. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Mark Martin from um, University of Puget Sound. Puget Sound. That's right. I'm looking here for... Having sex with viruses is unavoidable. Yeah, I think that's probably true. That's absolutely true. Can we have the link to the plague paper? I, I enjoy reading them before. Okay. Is it, It's in the uh, show notes, right, Michael? Yeah, it's in the show notes. <clears throat> so let me copy it right now because I have them right here. And okay. I will, I will paste it into the, to the chat. Yersinia pestis. Mutants are not susceptible to... Human compliment. All right, so I'll put it right in the chat here because I am one of the blessed people who can put links in the chat. And there you go. There you go. Let's see. Yeah, where but I, I discovered that paper because the editors of Applied Environmental Microbiology mm -hmm. retitled it. And a couple of weeks back, Vincent and Daniel on um, the uh, clinical update were talking about you know, how do you come up with titles? And the editor of AEM renamed this paper, how Eusinia pestis got its pathogenic groove. That's I think cool. they're riffing, riffing on a song title. And it, it really gets to the biology we're going to talk about tomorrow. Uh, so, so Andrew says, uh, Maurice Wilkins was born in Pongaroa, our only Nobel prize winner. Did you know that Michael? No. Maurice Wilkins, he was involved in, well, he did the first protein structure, right? Right. Who else have we got here to highlight? Uh, let's see. Before we get into some questions here, go all the way to the bottom. Ontario, we already have. Mark is in Tacoma, Washington. Thank that's you, right. Uh, Les, oh, Les, that's one of our mods. I don't know if I thanked you, but thank you, Les, for being here. San Juan, cool. Pacific Northwest. Oh, that's different. San Juan, Pacific Northwest. I would have said different. Cheryl is from Santa Rosa. Vanity is from Long Island, Montreal. White Plains, New York, not far. Australia. Good day. Okay. Oh, here's one. Turkey. I was looking for Turkey. Costa Rica. We got London and um, Michigan, Hartford, Connecticut, Wisconsin, so uh, Nevitt says, I ran mass spec for Meister on GST, which 35 plus years ago was then considered a big hydrophilic molecule, hard to analyze by MS, but we did it. Cool. Yeah. If we think about the mass specs of 35 years ago, they would take up the basement of chemistry buildings. Today, they sit on bench tops in every clinical lab in the country uh, as, in the form of a multi top. I mean, it's it, yeah. it's really incredible to watch the evolution of the instrumentation over these past 35 years of, of my active career as a, a faculty member. So Jack says, selenite is used in some science fiction stories to refer to a fictional native inhabitant of the moon. <laughs> Absolutely, as opposed to tellurium, which is, of course, referring to us earthlings. That's right. And if you go to the Air and Space Museum, they actually have an exhibit on selenium and telluride, uh, effectively referring to those science fiction stories. At least they did the first time I went to the Air and Space Museum when ASM was held in D.C. back in the early 80s. So, Michael, on the picture I, I have for this episode here, you have a stethoscope around your neck. So tell us what's going on uh, with that because you're not that, a doctor a, <laughs> i'm not a physician i don't intend to play a physician um uh, we were doing a study asking about um the inherent contamination of the average physician's stethoscope and we did a full-blown clinical trial between uh the emergency rooms of two hospitals and we fundamentally asked the question you know what's on them and Copper is antimicrobial and is continuously active. You don't have to do anything to it. It will inactivate bacteria, it will inactivate viruses, and it will inactivate fungi. 
and it just does it by coming in contact with it. And it, what it does is it destabilizes the viral capsid and in the bacteria and the fungi, it steals electrons from the membrane and results in uh, the generation of free radicals inside the cell. And then they end up committing uh, suicide from the free radical generation. And so we worked with 3M um, who makes, who owns Litton, the manufacturer of stethoscopes. And that was one of the stethoscopes that was in the study. Hmm. So our marketing people put a white coat on me um, and they said, put it around your neck, like all the docs. And so I did. And that <laughs> picture got me into all sorts of trouble. And, um, but, um, and one of my, uh, colleagues at work, who's a, a radiologist, uh, says, y you know how to use a stethoscope? I said, yeah. He says, you, the only way you should ever use a th stethoscope is on bare skin. And mm -hmm. anybody who ever examines you using a stethoscope through your shirt, they're doing it wrong. It's got to be on <laughs> naked skin. And makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Well, you get better sound conduction. And that stethoscope had a beryllium um, copper diaphragm. If you know anything about audiophiles or stereos, copper beryllium tweeters, I guess, are the be all to end all. And I guess mm. Macintosh speakers. Uh, not the Apple computer Macintosh, but the Macintosh amplifier yeah. and speaker company have these beryllium huh. uh, tweeters and they, they are superb at sound conduction. And it was a beryllium copper diaphragm and it transmitted the sound beautifully. And unfortunately, the clinicians didn't like them because we use real metal. Uh, it wasn't coated and they were a little bit too heavy for the physician's liking. But now there's other alternatives. They're now selling stethoscope covers, but it requires that you do something. And the beauty of copper was you didn't have to do anything. You just used it as you normally would. And if you forgot to sanitize them, you forgot to sanitize them and it did it itself. Right. Uh, because after every inpatient encounter, your clinician should sanitize the diaphragm, the sound conducting part of the stethoscope. And they should also wipe down the hoses as well, because they're coming in contact with your naked skin. And sometimes the infectious dose is only a few microbes. So correction, uh, Nevitz is right. Wilkins did the early structures of DNA. Not, not with correction. Rosalind was, Franklin. Yeah. I was thinking of John Kendrew who did myoglobin, uh, first, first protein structure. Right. Two Brits, you know, what can I do? <laughs> they all sound so, alike, uh, right? Squash, here's a, Mark has a question for you. Are you savant with respect to iron? I want to be able to spread an iron solution on a Petri dish to see if I can inhibit fluorescent siderophores. I'm not a savant on iron. That would be my colleague from graduate school, Fred Quinn, who worked in Gene Weinberg's lab at IU. Gene Weinberg, if you've ever read any of the early iron papers, he was the savant on all things iron. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Gene Weinberg passed away a couple of years back, well into his 90s. And um, it, some weird stuff happens. Uh, if you grow serratia marcescens, which Mark knows turns a beautiful red color at room temperature. If you put a little copper into the plate in the form of a penny, that serratia marcescent will now make a black pigment prodigiosin instead of the red one. And uh, it really freaked everyone out when we dropped a penny on a disc and uh, on the Petri plate and saw that the, just a little bit of the copper would leach out of the penny into the medium and it would turn the prodigiosin from red to black. So, um, cool. the only, so the only thing I can offer you, Mark, is to lower the pH to keep the iron and Fe plus two uh, a little bit longer. So you're probably lucky uh, to do it with uh, the lactobacilli and everything loves public siderophores. All right. So John says, 
Here, let me get you on here. I got click. I follow the channel's number file and computer file. I'm glad to report neither carry a meaning among its audience more than just being fans of math and comp sci. Right. So we're going to go with yes. Viro file. How that? I'm going to change this to Viro file because I really like a Viro file. It just got a, it's got a good ring to it. All right. Thank you. Yes, and, and Les is right. E. coli is in the house. Absolutely. Always. Now, here's here's one for you, Michael. Please explain the significance of gram-positive versus gram-negative for whole bacteria, other things. Well, um, gram-positive simply have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. And the way to think about peptidoglycan is like a skinny bicycle tire. And gram-negative bacteria have that skinny bicycle tire. Bacteria are all at about 80 pounds per square inch. But gram-positive bacteria have that BMX motorbike that can take the ruts and roughness because their tire tread is all that much thicker. And gram-positives have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan and consequently... Um, they are much more refractory to, um, you know, the, the ins and outs of uh, the environment, so to speak. Whereas gram negatives are better suited to deal with uh, things where they actually add that second layer of grease or that second unit membrane. Uh, and of course, they have the evil lipopolysaccharide with um, everybody's favorite license plate designator, O157H7. And everyone knows there are at least 157 O antigens in the lipopolysaccharide mm. of E. coli. And H7, you can blame the Dutch for because uh, they named flagellin, uh, they, they used an H as its antigen. And so that there are at least seven flagella of E. coli. At least that's what I keep telling the the dental students. They still get it wrong on the test. Do you have, do you have that on your license plate, Michael? No. I, I just have a very generic license plate. I'm too cheap <laughs> to buy vanity plates. <laughs> well, we could get ASM to give you some money, Michael. Yeah. It'll happen. Pete says, I'm finding bacteria harder to understand than viruses. Must mean Vincent has been teaching me well. Well, they are more complicated, right, Michael? They're, they're bigger and they have more genes and they have their own machines. And, you know, bacteria have been around for three and a half to four billion years, depending upon who you read. And they've literally done many more experiments than the entire human race many times over. And so that they, they keep what works and they toss what doesn't. All right, here's a virus question. I haven't vaccinated my two-year-old yet. I want to make sure that Pfizer is absolutely safe long-term. Anything you can tell me to help me convince myself. So it was first recommended for six months to five years in, back in June last year. There have been millions of doses given to this age group. You know, the usual local and systemic reactions, mild and nothing serious. And, you know... I, d I don't think we're we're not long term yet. We're only a year. You can't get a long term answer, but I don't see any long term. I mean, you know, in, in adults, it's been in there for three years, and I don't see why it would have a long term effect in kids. So, you know, you you the longer you wait, the more you're gambling that the child could get serious disease. So, I'd say, I mean, if I had a two year old, I'd I'd vaccinate him. I have no hesitation. It's probably the best thing I can tell you. <clears throat> so we and have if your uh, child's otherwise healthy and they've been responding equivalently well to the other childhood vaccines which we start yeah. you know literally the day they're born they're given the hepatitis b vaccine that's right and we keep vaccinating our kids to confer protection against the microbial world that's out to get them and remember one of the first vaccines they receive is dpt and diphtheria, remember that one of the earliest Nobel Prizes was uh, awarded for understanding something I learned on TWIB from Arturo Costa Duval about diphtheria antitoxin isolated mm. from the sera 
of convalescent patients. Huh. And, you know, that was awarded a Nobel Prize in the early 1900s. And, uh, you know, the yeah. lessons we learned yeah. from that were, as Arturo points out, have been applied to SARS-CoV-2. And we now know that convalescent sera does indeed work. And um, it, it does help those who cannot get vaccines to uh, fight off uh, the bad effects, but you got to get it early enough before the infection gets out of control, like everything else in virology. You know, early is often better. And Vincent, you're frozen. Yeah, I noticed that. I don't know why. Uh, I mean, because I'm not frozen myself. You know, I am here. No. Let me see if I remove myself from the stream and add myself back. Now I'm on the wrong side. <laughs> you're Michael cameras. now. Maybe I'll turn now the camera. Now you're still frozen on me. Let me turn the camera off and then on. Let's try that. And look at that. It's not getting a, a signal. This hasn't happened. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, let's Welcome see. What to else the technology do? world. What else can I do? Black magic design. That's me. I'm frozen. Am I going to be frozen all, all night? Uh, let's hope uh, not. So listeners or viewers, am I frozen at the moment? You're frozen on my screen. Yeah, I'm on my screen too. Now I'm now I'm on the other side. The video just died. Yeah, someone said my video just died. So let's see, what can I do to get the video going? Um, it could be the video switcher here. So let me pull the power on that and reboot it. Let's see how that goes. So now when in doubt down. reboot. That yeah. happened to me today. I woke up this morning after charging my phone all night. There we and go. That's it. That's there you it. go. When in doubt restart. Yeah, it was a good that's frozen right. expression, right? <laughs> yes. It was good. Your mouth wasn't open, so that's half the battle with me be worse all right so what was like here's an email here's a question for you michael is it ideal to use muller hinton auger for zone of inhibition assay or is triptic soy auger suitable you ask a really great question and it has to do with whether or not you're comparing the zones of inhibition triptychase soy auger will work so will muller hinton but muller hinton is the only one for which the database on antibiotic susceptibilities is uh developed in when you do antibiotic sensitivities, you have to follow the CSLI guidelines to the letter in order to compare and contrast the zones of inhibition to um, demonstrate that it works. And, and I do have good links to um, the CLSI guidelines, but unfortunately I can't share them because they're behind a paywall. Those, those mm -hmm. folks put everything behind a paywall and unfortunately I can't share them, but you can probably find some illicit ones out there in the internet, if you know what I mean. Uh, they are indeed out there. Okay. You know, the paywall is an ugly mistress. So regarding NOPV2, how did they determine the seven cases in, in children in Africa were uh, from it and not some other intro? They have to do genome sequencing. They have to take fecal material and uh, do some genome sequencing. And otherwise, you're right. It could be some other enterovirus. And so that's the way you confirm it. Yeah. yeah. But do you have, in those enteroviruses, if you find an enterovirus that causes paralysis in NOPV2, how do you know which one is responsible for the paralysis? Or is it a mixture of the two that is actually setting off the immune crisis that results in the uh, demyelination? So um, that's a question for Amy. It's a question for Amy. Did you hear that, Amy? Uh, wait for your text. She's probably <laughs> listening. Oh uh, God! And uh, she'll send us the the question to that. I, I think it's about reads, right? It's so that you yeah. gotta get a lot of polio reads. If that's done by sequencing, deep sequencing, or it could be um, uh, PCR, and they're amplifying. I don't know, Amy. How do they do that? Let me know. It's probably, text. my guess is it's Oxford Nanopore. That seems to be what they're using for the, uh, 
these short reads. I mean, I remember listening to one of your twibs about flu and it's, you need, you need deep sequencing in order to get a sufficient number of reads in order to be confident in the data that you're getting back. So, so someone suggests you can email the first author of a paper and often they'll give it, they'll give you a PDF. Yeah. So you can always try that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's the mechanism of copper against Pseudomonas and MRSA? I think you talked about that already. It pulls the electrons off, right? It steals electrons and the microbe goes into an electron deficit. And you all can do this experiment yourselves if you just think about it. The average volume of bacterial cell is 10 to the minus 15 liters. Uh, the chemistry of all biology is what? About 7476. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's an absolute concentration of proton and which is moles per liter. So then you remember Avogadro and his number and you can figure out how many free protons are present in a microbial cell at any moment in time. And for every electron that goes into a membrane, a proton has to be ejected and then eventually get cycled back in regardless of it's an aerobe or an anaerobe. The Anaerobes put their waste electrons into organic acids and the aerobes, of course, put it into oxygen and make water. But if you have no proton to come back in, you're, you're like musical chairs or you, you don't have anybody to escort the electron back in. And the consequence is those electrons that are being generated during metabolism just get added to the oxygen molecule uh, either um, an oxyanion or an oxygen molecule that's part of the, you know, the solution chemistry of the cell. And that generates internal free radicals. And once you generate a sufficient number of free radicals, you destroy uh, the membrane by poking a hole in it. You bleach proteins. And uh, of course, the, the hydrogen peroxide that you're generating, the oxygen radicals, destroy the nucleic acid of the cell, both RNA and DNA. And without that, there's no mutants. And when you finally finish the calculation on how many free protons there are there, you're going to find that given the fluence of electrons going into the membrane per unit time, which is on the order of a million to 10 million per second, you're effectively running out of protons very quickly and the cell quickly dies from free radical attack. Mike, um, Mark Martin, I, I have up here on, uh, above Michael, micronauts. That's one of the words you like to use. It what's is. An, that's Mark Snort. What's another one, Mark? I couldn't think of offhand one of the other ones. Let me know. Okay. Elise says, I love my nitrifying bacteria in my fish tanks. Is bottled bacteria useful or should I just grow it on its own? <laughs> you have to define what bottled bacteria are. Are, are they, you know, uh, probiotic that has the nitrifying bacteria in it? If so, they've probably been lyophilized and they've been verified that when you add it, the capsule dissolves and they know that the nitrifying bacteria are viable and will actually replenish your tanks. But if you can grow your own, so much the better. But remember, the diversity, each time you grow it on your own, you're selecting based on your conditions. Mm -hmm. And there's the very famous um, scientist, uh, Lenski, who has done that by growing many, many successive generations of E. coli. And E. coli isn't always E. coli. Uh, it's the famous Lenski experiment. So Andrew says 50 plus Brazil nuts a day can result in radiation toxicity, I understand. Well, it's hard to eat 50 plus. They're so darn hard to get out of the shell that after yes. a couple you give up. And they say that's enough. Of course, unless you buy a bag of shelled ones, then you could be in trouble. And, and, you know, I, I don't find them that tasty. They're not up there with walnuts and pecans and almonds. I, I learned how to pronounce almonds the proper way when I was out in Sacramento. <laughs> and the almond, almond farmers, they, were, they pronounce it almond. And our, our producer for TWIM, Ray Ortega, is actually from Sacramento. And he agrees it's almond. It's Ammon. Oh, man. I bet they, nobody they refer says... to it as Ammon. 
Uh, I, I use almond. I'm too used to it. Sorry. Yeah, I use almond. I use almond as well. Let's see. We have New Orleans here. We have Bremerton, Washington, and we have San Jose, Costa Rica. We have Isle of Man. Cool. Um, Mark brings o treats to his office hours. Yes. So does Brianne. But here on the stream, we can't bring any treats. So you just have to enjoy us. <laughs> I have a copper top. Now, oh, let's see. Where's my camera? Uh, right there. There you go. Oh, that's very nice. So, Michael, when you make a stethoscope out of uh, copper, what does copper. it do? Does it decrease hospital-acquired infections? Uh, that's too hard of an experiment to do because you don't know where they've acquired. Causality is the issue. You can demonstrate that the microbial load is reduced, and you, you effectively are making the argument load drives infection. And we were able to demonstrate that in spades when we did the copper study. We increased the dose of copper on frequently touched objects in the built environment, and we were able to reduce the incidence of infection by almost 70% in all patients who entered the room with uh, six copper objects. Mm. We covered the rails of the bed, the call button, and these are typically the most frequently touched objects by the clinician as well as the patient. And they actually, and we were able to show it was dose dependent because unfortunately when I was designing the clinical trial, I forgot that America was getting heavy and I didn't design in a copper bariatric bed. And so when we had some bariatric patients in the study, of course, the bed had to be removed. And that was the largest dose of copper. And we saw when we removed that dose, the incidence of infections went up uh, subsequent to um, having the patient in a bariatric bed. And so hmm. it, it was really quite interesting. And we, we effectively crippled the MRSA and VRE transfer rates in the units simply because we suppressed them to uh, a level where they were no longer resident in the built environment. So are, any hospitals, crazy. are any hospitals installing copper? There are, there have been a few. Um, it's a capital expense. And if you are a MBA making a decision, do you buy a revenue generating machine? Or revenue sparing machine and our system is effectively infection sparing and revenue sparing and so you make the decision buying a seven tesla mri versus putting copper in nih oh. or i should say cms had a calculator a value proposition calculator up on the cms website for about three months and i put in the cost of copper outfitting the icu at my hospital and was able to determine that I could literally save $6 million in infection costs by investing uh, $70,000 in copper fittings for the hospital rooms. And, you know, I presented those data to C-suites and uh, architects and designers, and it, it's, it's a hard sell. But during COVID, I got contacted by the director of the Sovereign Fund of Australia. So this is the guy who invests the Australian pension fund funds. And Australia is building a large number of nursing homes uh, and extended care facilities because many folks are retiring to Australia and New Zealand. And they thought by putting in antimicrobial copper surfaces into retirement homes, they could reduce the incidence of infection and so save the national health system significant capital. But then COVID happened and uh, the rest, as they say, is uh, a delay. A delay, yes. Okay, Simon says, your chat makes me ask a question. Does such clever equipment mean today's students aren't as good at asking questions and finding difficult answers? Um, it's funny you should bring this up. Um, today was uh, TEDx Charleston, and I happened to have the honor of coaching uh, an environmental physician by the name of Michael Bioschmidt. And the title of his talk is, um, paraphrasing it a little bit, 
It's about the lack of curiosity in medicine. And we really need to think about making our clinical teams more curious about what's making everyone ill. You know, we, we grew up in an era of medicine that was principally designed, um, defined by Flexner back in the, you know, early 1920s, where they brought in the scientific method. And during that time, of course, you know, the incidence of a strep infection and killing you was eight out of 10 people who got strep died. So it was the era of antibiotics. And so medicine just stuck on the anti theme. So now we have antibiotics, we have antihypertensives, and when in doubt, prescribe an antidepressant. And um, th that's often what we see happening is if you don't fit in the round hole and you happen to be a square peg, they really struggle with making a diagnosis because they have to go back to first principles oftentimes, which requires you to have a very curious clinician. And, you know, some medical schools are only teaching the 10 most common diseases and teaching the medical students only to think about that. And I think that's pretty scary because as we know, you, you just look at the last two years, we've had COVID, we've had MPOX, 10 years ago, we had Zika. And then of course you look back 15, we had SARS one, all of which were, you know, unknowns. And we get flu periodically. Yeah. We get flu a lot. This is a good one. When you're in your lane, there's no traffic. That's true. But Sequence, it doesn't make okay. it as much fun. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the answer from Amy here. Uh-oh. We woke Amy up. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> L20B soup. Okay. She's, she's answering. All right. So, so let's continue here. Um, our adenoviruses transmissible through droplets and aerosols or fomites or all of the above. So there are, yes. there are there are respiratory adenoviruses, there are ocular, there are gastrointestinal. So yeah, all of the above. Yeah. And as, as my dental students will learn, or I think they learned this afternoon, is that, you know, the most common occurrence of pink eye is from adenovirus, not yeah, pseudomonas. That's right. So does hand sanitizer inactivate them? So they're, they're, you know, they're icosahedral like polio and norovirus. So I'm not sure uh, if, if that's a good. For norovirus, you need to have the special hand sanitizer. You need, low pH. You need the low pH. And we, you need, we you need really 70% ethanol. It's the low pH that does it? It's the low pH. We did that paper on TWIM a few episodes back. Oh. There, there was that paper that came out of Gojo. And it was a Gojo sanitizer that had a lower pH. I think it was pH five and it was able to inactivate norovirus. Remember they were looking at countertops in uh, the food service industry. I'm typing to Amy. Okay. You may type to Amy. So here we go. Um, Okay, so we have it. So Amy says what they do is, uh, this is very interesting. There is um, a cell line called L20B, which was made in my laboratory. It's a, a mouse fibroblast line with the human polio receptor produced. And polio is the only enterovirus that will infect it. So you take fecal material from the kid, you filter it, and you put it on the cells. If you get CPE, it's polio, and then you sequence it. But it doesn't... The, the question now is why, how do you rule out other enteroviruses? So there's always an RT-PCR step, she says, before the sequencing. So uh, how do you rule out um, other enteroviruses? So she says, like, you shouldn't say that you're talking to me. Okay. Just asking about methods. All right, never mind. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know how you rule out other enterals, although, it, Michael, polio is rarely there. So if you see it, then that's really causing the paralysis. Yeah, I, I kind of figured that. It's just that 
you know, you, you look at these other enteroviruses like Amy's working on that do indeed cause a limited amount of paralysis and in a very rare instance. So it's probably you're rarely lucky, there. You're lucky if you can get doctors to wash their hands, much less this. Necessary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, there's a very famous um, infection control physician out of uh, the UK, Stephanie Dancer. And she once told me that she was going to have back surgery. And the night before the surgery, she and her children went in and scrubbed the hospital room she was going to be in head to foot. You know, she and her, she had her children uh, effectively be sentinels to make sure everyone who came into her room uh, hmm. used good old soap and water and washed their hands. Yeah, washing hands is good. When the when the Purell doesn't work, the hand washing will. Yeah. The, the average, the average nurse in a modern hospital, if they work an eight hour shift washes their hands one hour per eight. So, you know, of their eight hour shift, one hour is devoted to washing their hands. Uh, here we have, uh, from the cola in Italy, they make pure beryllium tweeters. Also synthetic diamonds are used. Audiophiles are crazy. That's true. All right, let's see what else we have here. Oh, look at this. M uh, Rob says beryllium is used in ear monitors. It's not just full-size headphones. All right. So we struck a nerve. So these beryllium things I'm a... using, these in-ear monitors must may have beryllium in them. So some of them are really expensive. So maybe that's why, yes. right? Yes. Maybe that's it's, why. it's all about the audio quality and the clarity and all of those wonderful things. And uh, modern American pennies from 82 are copper-plated zinc. Yes, unfortunately. Zinc's a little <laughs> bit antimicrobial, but not much. It's not as good as copper. Copper is is that rare metal. Um, and it's one of the only colored metals. I mean, gold's of course colored, copper is colored, and um, everything else is a dull gray. Mark says peptidoglycan acts like Spanx underwear. I don't even know what Absolutely. Spanx underwear is. I don't know what that is. It, it basically gives you a svelte figure. It sucks your gut in. Um, Rosalind Franklin. Oops, I have to select less here. Her team figured out what form of DNA gave the clearest photos. Photo 51 was done by her postdoc, James Gosling. That's right. The famous photo 51 that Watson and Crick picked up off her desk, right? Yep. And said, this is the structure. Uh, Brian wants to know, why don't we have copper dressings? They already are silver they, ones. There are copper dressings out there. Um, the Chinese have been using copper dressings. There are silver ones. There are silver is interesting in that what happens is they couple the silver ion, the AG plus to EDTA. Mm -hmm. And as the interstitial fluid comes out, and they're especially used in burn patients, the silver is then released from the EDTA, EDTA matrix. And then the silver ion reacts with the sulfhydrols in the membranes of the microbes and activating. Remember, bacteria don't have any reduced sulfur material, reduced sulfur bonds inside them. They're all on the outside. So copper works. Um, and I, I guess it's a matter of, um, you know, doing the clinical trial to ask the question whether or not it will work. Polio Pete wants to know how close are we to developing new antibiotics to combat current circulating superbugs? So, Michael, what would a superbug be? Like MRSA? Is that a superbug? It, it's all about the number of antimicrobial resistance traits or the ones inherent to the resistome of the bacterium. And if you think about it, 
the antibiotics always have a target. Uh, a lot of our antibiotics are directed against peptidoglycan, that unique mo molecule that's the molecular Spanx. And when you prevent crosslinking, it's like a run in a nylon stocking. And as you grow, you bulge and you eventually explode. Then there are other bacteria that have resistances to DNA gyrase. And of course, gyrase is really important because in order to read DNA, you have to unwind it. And the DNA molecule inside the bacterium is one millimeter in length, yet they're only one micron in size. So you have to wind up the DNA like a rubber band. And mm -hmm. so that's what gyrase facilitates is the winding and unwinding. And if you target gyrase, you of course will screw up the DNA molecule and then without DNA, you're dead. Then of course, there's um, the class of drugs like rifamycin, which is an RNA synthetic inhibitor. So you don't make any RNA, no messages. And that's why the RIFs, the rifamycin is so good at controlling TB because TB never divides. It's got generation times in, in hours, not minutes. And if you've ever grown any, even of the fast growing mycobacteria, you get gray hair waiting for them to come up on a plate. And mm -hmm. so, but they're always making a few messages. And so that's why RIF is such a great drug for TB. And the superbugs are developing this armamentarium of uh, collecting all these traits. They're effectively like card collectors or the rabid pin collectors at Disney World. They're collecting all these traits and that's where the superbug is. And then to have an antimicrobial that is effective against a new target. So people are always looking at, at new targets. Um, Steve Projam, who developed tigracycline, uh, when he was at Letterly, uh, once told me, um, I used to work on the molecule sec A, which is the principal soluble export factor in E. coli in all other bacteria that ask but one question of every protein in the cell. Would you like to go out? <laughs> would you and like to go out? That's great. Would you like to go out? And it puts its arm around it and it takes it to the mm -hmm. membrane. And sec A then interacts with membrane machinery. And it's also an ATPase and it burns a little you know, uh, high energy mm. squiggle and the protein gets ratcheted out through the, uh, sec Y E G complex. And that's of course, type two secretion. Right. And Steve said to me once I was at an ASM, um, meeting with him, he says, you know, I tried to develop an antibiotic against that molecule for years. It drove us crazy because it's a great target because it's a universally required process, bacterial protein export. Remember 40% of the cell protein goes out. And if you can knock out that system, you're done. Stick a why, fork in you. Why does so much protein go out? It's because they need stuff. You know, the, just think of the siderophores that Mark brought up earlier. That's uh -huh. a public good that gets exported. They I also see. put things in the outer membrane. They put things in the membrane. They put things in the periplasmic space. All these transport factors are outside of that hydrogen tight membrane. So mm -hmm. they have to get across the grease layer. And remember the bacterial membrane is hydrogen tight. And right. we know hydrogen doesn't like to be contained. It wants to get out. It escapes the gravity of the earth after all. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so I have a teaching moment here. So the someone in the chat made a comment, and the moderators rightfully deleted it. Uh, it was about the fact that the mRNA vaccines are not safe because they cause class switching. Okay. Ooh. Now, so this reflects... Uh, a lack of knowledge about the immune response because class switching is what happens in any immune response, right? You switch from it's what IgM you want. to IgG. It has to happen to make high affinity antibodies. So it's not a negative, but, you know, it's been portrayed as a negative because people don't understand immune responses. So 
it's it's very sad to me that you know these kinds of negativities arise from uh, not understanding. So that's too bad. And and you if you think about it, it's why we used oral polio vaccines for so many years because of the secretion <laughs> of IgA in the gut that protected our guts right. against subsequent polio infections. You know, it, it yeah, effectively yeah. provided the immune response, which we don't get from the inactivated polio vaccine. We don't get that wonderful mucosal immunity that we got from the oral polio vaccine because we didn't have the full correlates of infection in our gut, which is the natural site of the infection. Okay, Dr. Schmidt, how do allergy shots for hay fever differ from viral immunizations? <laughs> Oh, th this is Pandora's box. Um, I don't know what are in allergy shots. It's it's uh, generally sometimes they're lectins associated with the pollen. Sometimes mm. they're pollen. Um, so it's a really complicated um, issue. And I would stay in my lane and refer you to the allergist who's compounding that witch's brew and the allergy shot. Yeah, it's, it's basically they try and give you things that you are allergic to in, in, the, in the effort to dampen the allergy, eventually. You give enough shots, and, and which doesn't always work, but occasionally it does. But yes, it's out of our lane. Yes. Would you vaccinate a two-year-old who has had COVID, and would you boost them a third time? <clears throat> so we did a paper on immune yesterday, which was fabulous, a review of all kinds of immunity and the best immunity on the planet against SARS-CoV-2 is to have two vaccines and a natural infection in either order, infection, vaccine, 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 infection. So if your two-year-old has had COVID and they have had two shots, boom, you're good. You know, I don't think and, and the thing that's really interesting is that if you give a booster too soon, say, after infection, you're interrupting the natural affinity maturation of the antibodies because they're in the lymph nodes making better antibodies. And then this new antigen comes in, and they get distracted and they interrupt what they've been doing. So it's worse to give a booster so close to a natural infection. So I would say. You're good to go based on that article. That was by Shane Crotty and Alessandro Sette. Really good article. And I always like reading their papers because they're so well constructed and clear. Really Even good. for immunology. Even for it immunologists. Is. is it true that you can email the first author? Yes, it is true. And if usually the first author has done a lot of the work on the paper, so they're happy to do it. Michael would send you this. If he published a paper, he would do it. No problem. And when now that we have open access, I, I've been a strong proponent that um, I actually chair the appointments, promotion and tenure committee. And what I've been telling the dean is that he needs to uh, develop a fund to facilitate open access page charges for his faculty who are you know, either don't have a grant to pay for it or, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you, you have the trade-off. It's a, it's the bargain. Do you pay the graduate student stipend or do you pay for the open access page charges? And, um, it's a really challenging question and, you know, universities get indirect costs at my institution. They correct indirect costs on the salary I free up yeah. and, it, you can't tell me it takes 50% of my salary effort. You know, fit the overhead at my institution is 50 cents on the dollar collected. And I can't see paying my salary. You know, they just change a fund source from A to B once when the grant goes live. And that can't be costing them. And I say, you know, we have to think about um, getting our science out there and available to the public because the public is are the folks who are underwriting our ability to do science it's not the congress uh the public by virtue of the fact of their 
telling their elected officials that science has value and this is where good stuff comes from. Uh, let's see. Why do bacteria, some bacteria give off a bad odor, Michael? <laughs> That's easy. It's because of where they dump their waste electrons. They go into short chain fatty acids and, and most of the bacteria in and on us are God fearing anaerobes. So they can't use oxygen to dump their waste electrons into. And so when you dump a waste electron into oxygen, it makes water. We know that's colorless, odorless, and tasteless. But if you dump it into something like um, <laughs> pyruvic acid, you end up making lactic acid, which is a sour vinegar-like smell. Or if it goes into acetyl-CoA, it becomes acetic acid, which is vinegar. And you can do this experiment at home. Take your little finger, rub it behind your ear, and then smell. And you'll actually smell what the waste electrons are going into them. And those short chain fatty acids that the microbes have been dumping their electrons into, even if you just taken a shower, you'll smell some shampoo, but you'll also smell the short chain fatty acids. Huh. And when I That's go out and talk to middle school children, I tell them to take their little finger and put it into their belly button and smell it versus behind their ear. And it's a different odor because it's a, different flora because the belly button's a little more moist than behind your ear. So why short chain fatty acids is an energetically favorable receptor? It's, it's all about NAD. You can't <laughs> burn any carbon unless you have oxidized NAD. And so we all remember the evil Emden Meyerhoff pathway. We memorized it probably in high school today. And, you know, the, the electrons go into NAD and they become NADH. And what do you do with that NADH? You got to get rid of that H. And so what you do is you dump it into this short chain fatty acid and you make the acid. So okay. you end up making acetate, you make into acetic acid, you would make lactic acid, you make, and, and in some cases you make ethanol, which right. ain't bad. Oh, I love bacterial metabolism. It's just, Michael makes it so straightforward. It's really good. All right. So um, Michael said, uh, a heart surgeon turned health guru named Jack Cruz explores how light sculpts the microbiome. Does research into microbiome with red or blue light have clinical applications? Probably. <laughs> Everything is probably. Until you do the experiment, you don't really know. But, you know, we recently did a paper on TWIM talking about a seven Tesla magnet being able to stimulate bacteria. So who knew magnets could stimulate the growth of microbes, a magnetic field. So we know that red light will actually select out so certain photosynthetic bacteria as will blue light. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, you know, there's a photosphere and the bacteria literally know their lane of where they'll be able to harvest the most amount of energy in order to do things. But from what I understand, there's no lights on in my gut unless I've eaten one of Mark's glow in the dark bacteria. Mark just left for dinner. Bye Mark. Thank you. for coming. Bye Mark. Barb, Barb Max says, isn't there supposed to be a good ratio between copper and zinc? How does that work in bacteria? Well, the, the bacteria it's, it's all about a proper diet. And, uh, of course, both copper and zinc are essential micro trace elements and eating all the proper foods in, in a well-balanced diet will give you the right ratios of copper and zinc, because that's what's effectively in the earth's crust. And that's effectively how we all evolved. And it's probably why iron sulfur proteins are so important because Iron is the predominant metal on planet mm. Earth. And, you know, it's all about evolution at the end. Speaking of evolution, Mark said the dead hand of Darwin is on all that lives. That's Absolutely. a good one. I like that one. Um, and Mark also said, since we're talking about Quoting Mark, Mark, a pecan is something you keep next to your bed. Oh, Mark. You get it, Michael? 
I do indeed. Of course you do. Pecan. Pecan. <laughs> he must have had a proper mother to teach him to properly pronounce pecan as opposed to pecan. 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 Um, that's hysterical about pecans. Did you say something hysterical about pecans? What did you say? I can't even remember now. No, no. All right. No. We were talking about Brazil nuts, and I, I said I like pecans, walnuts, uh, and almonds, and that's how we got went down that rabbit hole. All right, so PVV says English is my wheelhouse and linguistics. There isn't really a proper pronunciation for words. They vary greatly based on region and group. That's true. That's I concur. True. <clears throat> Michael, would, would a copper sulfate spray work? Uh, copper sulfate is the soluble form of copper. So it's in the wrong oxidation state. Uh -huh. It's elemental copper. And when you get down to the quantum mechanics, it's the elemental form of the copper that has the greatest level of bactericidal activity because it's got the greatest electrical sink signature. And it's all about establishing a quantum tunnel between the bacterial membrane, which is very close to the metal. And so copper sulfate, the copper is effectively Cu plus two. Mm -hmm. So it's a very oxidized form of copper. So it's not very attractive uh, to, to um the metal per se, um, electrochemists know more of this than, than I do. And it's all, it goes into the realm of electrochemistry and quantum mechanics. Wow. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. Bacteria, you know, when, when I was a graduate student at IU, we had a faculty member by the name of Howard Guest who was working on, um, stromatolites. And what I learned is that bacteria can actually fractionate isotopes because mm -hmm. they would determine the sulfur isotope that the bacterium would be able to fractionate. So bacteria not only can select the proper atom that they want, they can select the right ratio of isotopes that they preferentially collect. And, you know, there's a whole family of copper isotopes, uh, excuse me, um, uh, sulfur isotopes that we routinely use. And, of course, the form of sulfur used is always in the, the oxidation state of sulfide. And, of course, there's sulfur 31, there's sulfur 32, there's sulfur 33, there's sulfur 34 and 35. And various bacteria would preferentially select those isotopes and that's how you could tell them apart without any nucleic acid yeah so you know, this, Michael, is, this is sequencing doesn't answer all the questions no <laughs> you you have to know some chemistry and uh it always goes back to first principles and that's one of the things i always try to impart to anyone is you know one of my good friends at iu was cheryl blake and uh, I still remember I asking her this question. She never lets me forget it. I asked her, where do you get dirt? Because we were TA in a class together and we were doing selective enrichments. And um, I said, where should we get the dirt? And she said, I know you're from Chicago and you, you don't have farms in Chicago. You just go outside. There's plenty of dirt outside. <laughs> but IU had this great greenhouse. And it had all of these different microclimates in it, everything from growing bananas and the subtropics to desert environments. And so I was mm. asking a legit question, but she never forgets, lets me forget where do you get dirt. And Michael, one of the students. What's the difference between dirt and soil? It's because I grew up in the city and I call it dirt, which my mother called it. And soil is what an agronomist refers to it as. Because it is soil. Soil is such a nicer name, isn't it? Yes. They're both four letters. So, <laughs> um, How effective is brass in proportion to pure copper? Brass works. 
Uh, brass is an alloy of copper. It's, um, I always forget what brass is. There's, there's so many different, um, pure copper is of course the best antimicrobial. And as you begin to dope the alloys, which if you think about it, an alloy is nothing more than other elements mixed together and you're forming an amalgamation or an alloying of elements next to one another to facilitate electrical flow and to make the metal more malleable and um, brass. I think if, if I get this wrong, I'll be in trouble with the copper people. Brass, brass is an alloy of copper and zinc together. Mm, right. Zinc has so, no antimicrobial properties, right? It has a, it has some. Okay. And brass has some antimicrobial properties, and brass is antimicrobial. The the minimum concentration of of copper that gets the EPA designation of antimicrobial copper is sixty percent. So it's got to be at least sixty percent copper by weight, copper metal by weight in order to get the antimicrobial mark from the US EPA. <laughs> uh, many of my friends swear by colloidal silver. I'm aware it has some antimicrobial effects. It should, right, Michael? It, it does, but the problem is, is remember silver is photoreactive and you could end up looking like a Smurf because the silver will go into your skin and then when you go out into the sun it'll turn you blue <laughs> so you end up looking like papa smurf so if, if you're looking and hence the term blue bloods uh because you know people who yeah, you yeah. know use that silver would actually get this blue tinge right. from all the silver that was leaching out of their silverware Nancy wants to know, how is it that some bacteria enter the spinal cord, cause meningitis in some people, or as in others, the same would just cause flu-like symptoms? It's all about trophism and um, what's on the surface of the bacterium and what it grabs onto. One of the first principles you teach in medical school is you always put the infection in a body site. And there are some bacteria that have receptors on their cell that like our epithelial layer. Mm -hmm. They like our endothelial layer. They, they just have a predilection for those areas. And so the Neisseria meningitidis actually has an affinity for our meninges. And so it can attach. And of course, because it has such a reactive form of LPS, it causes massive amounts of inflammation and can ultimately result in disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. Hmm. What a word. <laughs> yes. DIC is what they abbreviate it with, but it means you can't clot. Most mushroom mycelium is amazingly good at transporting and distributing metals in their structures. Yes. Would soap containing copper make sense? Uh, from the per perspective of the sewage treatment plant, that would be bad. Uh, because then you would be mm. sending all that copper into the sludge and you couldn't use the sludge for fertilizer. And in fact, the hog lagoons of North Carolina ran into that problem. They would routinely put a little bit of copper into the animal feed in order to reduce the farm to table time. And the consequence was the pig lagoons began to accumulate toxic amounts of copper in the sludge. Oh. And when they used that sludge to put on the fields to fertilize it, copper would substitute in chlorophyll instead of magnesium, you'd get the copper and then you'd get no photosynthesis. So it's, <laughs> it, you have to figure out what you want to do when, and the bacteria in and on us are doing a job that we grew up. They grew up with us to do. And so as long as you routinely are appropriately debriding your skin of excess microbes and your nose is a good detector, um, you can, of course, protect yourself. You don't need to be sterile because that would be bad because remember, the bacteria are mostly doing good things for us. They're giving us vitamins and they're helping us process our minerals to make certain that we have 
good bone health and all of those wonderful things. Thank you, Silvio Pina, for your contribution from L.A. And while we're at it, please uh, hit the like button, folks. There are 269 of you out there. We have 160 likes. So right below the video screen, hit it, and um, we'd appreciate it. Best food sources for copper, liver, spirulina, shiitake mushrooms, almonds, and cashews. It seems, Michael, that you don't want to have too much copper in your diet, though, right? No. And I, I, I personally have given up liver. <laughs> I perfectly even even with the bacon and the onions, I still have given up the liver. But too much copper will destroy your microbiome, right? Uh, yeah, know. probably. It, it it's probably going to be metabolized and dumped over over the side as quickly as possible. The transit time's pretty quickly on foods. Okay, so the kind of copper that these uh, these plants uh, would have would be not m metallic copper. It would be going into chlorophyll. It would be swapping out the magnesium yeah. for the the copper. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Um. Which medical schools, Michael? I don't know what that refers to. Maybe where you did some. Well, I teach at the Medical University of South Carolina, which is in Charleston. Charleston. And there are some medical schools that are, you know, doing disease-focused curricula. There's others that teach the 10 most common diseases. And you can go off to the AAMC, the American Association of Medical Colleges, and their curricula of the various schools in the country are described in great detail. And oftentimes medical students, as they're shopping for medical schools, they look because not all medical schools have the same type of curricular approach. Uh, the big discernment is between the allopathic medical schools and the osteopathic medical schools. And there's at least two flavors of those. I happen to teach at an allopathic medical school. There are others that are allopathic, which are more into uh, skeletal manipulations and other subtleties that I don't understand as well. And uh, other schools are focusing on diseases and they each have a unique mission that they're either targeting to training specialty physicians or training primary care physicians. And, and so again, it's whatever happens to be the mission of those schools. But at the end of the day, they're all um, expected to be a good general physician by the time they get through licensing, which generally requires three examinations, step one, two, and three, which requires they complete an intern year. And then they often do a residency on top of that in a specialty or a principal area like family medicine or primary care. And Mark says the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, but that's funny. Isaac. As absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Are we both saying absolutely? <laughs> mm. Let's see. My cousin was on a lot of steroids for cancer treatment, landed in the hospital, figured out it was an adenovirus that got her sick. I don't know which one. Steroids will do that. It will immunosuppress you. Yes, that will do it. Um, it always about... makes you feel better, too. It makes you feel better and you think you're getting better, but it's just hiding the infection, literally from your immune system. Um where is it? What about vinegar and hand sanitizer? Will it lower the pH enough? Hmm. It does. And, but you know, it's, it's the question of, do you know how to <clears throat> properly compound it in right. order? You don't want the pH to go too low. You don't want the pH to be too high and you don't want to dilute the alcohol concentration below the critical threshold, which for isopropyl is 70 percent and for ethanol i believe it's 66 percent and the mechanical function of hand washing makes a big difference that's true right michael 
Yeah, debriding. You're you're effectively pulling off that dead layer of skin. And if you've ever watched a surgeon scrub in, they use a brush to effectively get off that layer of skin that the bacteria are attaching themselves to. So they don't literally drop any into you or in the OR, even though they gown and they're, they're all covered. They're effectively trying to uh, protect you and the uh, operatory from uh, inherent contamination. Tom writes, did I hear properly Twiv 955, uh, 995 actually, uh, potential recombination between poliovirus and other enteros? Yes. The, um, <clears throat> we already know, and maybe it was 955, maybe you're right, Tom, um, that uh, when, when say the oral polio vaccines are reproducing in your gut, they, re they recombine with other enteroviruses that are there. In fact, OPV does that all the time. And so what I was wondering about the children in Africa uh, was whether the NOPV2 from them are recombinants. And we don't know because we don't have a sequence yet. But hopefully uh, we will have that soon. Let's see. Which one was I going to select here? Hmm. Bring back Ignaz Semmelweis. Do you remember him, Michael? Absolutely. Uh, he was an OBGYN <laughs> physician in Vienna, Austria. And he and his pathology students took care of the wealthy of Vienna, Viennese society. And uh, the midwives took care of the poor folk. And the rich folk were dying from um, uh, good old streptococci because he and his pathology residents would come from the anatomy lab where they were, you know, interacting with dead bodies without gloves. And then they would go and deliver a brand new spanking baby uh, from the rich of Vienna without washing their hands. And the midwives <laughs> were very assiduous in washing their hands and making certain that they were taking care of the women who couldn't afford care. And uh, Semmelweis, of course, made this observation and was ridiculed and actually um, <laughs> fought. And, um, you know, it was a, a long, arduous time. He, he was one of the pioneers of infection control along with Florence Nightingale, the, the famous nurse as well as the father of Oliver Wendell Holmes, the great Supreme Court Justice, who is a physician at Harvard Medical School. Hmm. What was his and name? And these were all the early, it was Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., not Jr. Okay. okay. And they were all pioneers of the early days of infection control, along with Lister, uh, who yeah, was Lister, the right. advocate of carbolic acid. Right. And, you know, <laughs> pouring it over their hands before they would go into the sterile cavity. Right. And, you know, that's really what advanced surgery is of effectively the, the introduction of aseptic techniques mm -hmm. of, you know, washing your hands and debreeding them. And then of course the great leap forward was gloves. You're yeah. probably old enough. I know I'm old enough to have remember wet fingered dentistry. And when I talk to with my dental students about wet fingered dentistry, they look at me like I have three heads. I said, yeah, I grew up with a dentist who put his naked hands into my mouth to do things. And of course, now you wouldn't let a dentist near you without gloves on. I went to the dentist But that's today. the way medicine was. I went to the dentist today, Michael, and he said he loves TWIV. Isn't that great? Yeah. I really like that. Uh, a man who came through Ellis Island was told to put a blue stone on his eye. Copper sulfate to cure trachoma? Probably would work. Yes. Because the copper sulfate would leach in and the bacteria, the endogenous flora would effectively transform it and change it. And remember, chlamydia is pretty easy to kill. 
because you're effectively concentrating the copper in the, because it's a, it's a intracellular parasite. So it's got to grow in our cells mm. in order to get it. And Ellis Island was notorious. When my grandmother came through Ellis Island, I still remember her telling the story of how they put a crochet hook in her eye to see whether or not she had any scarring from trachoma because what El the Ellis Island immigration officers wanted to make sure is that you weren't going to go blind and become a burden to society or yourself uh, huh, when so, you immigrated in because trachoma was one of the major yeah. causes of blindness. So would they and have sent course, her back if they found it? They would have sent her back. Wow. They would have sent her back until the day she died, even though she was a U eventually became a U.S. citizen, she was always afraid they would send her back. Oh, that's not a good way to live. Well, it's, it's what they, you know, both my grandfather and grandmother, my Schmitz, uh, immigrated to the U.S. from Austria uh -huh. uh, in, I believe, 1906. Wow. Uh, New York Cohen says, my son was 15 months old when the pandemic started. He started wanting to wash his hands all the time because he saw us doing it. Well, that's good. Imitation. It's right? a good behavior. Yeah. Huh. And he probably now knows the words to happy birthday by heart. Because that's how long you need to wash your hands. <laughs> all right. This one is for you, Michael. Uh, Speaking of disinfectants, what would be the effectiveness of a broad spectrum pet safe disinfectant with benzalkolium chloride and polyhexamethylene biguanide hydrochloride as active constituents? <laughs> All right. Knows? So, benza, it, if you look at the chemistry of uh, the benzalkonium, it's effectively going to destabilize the outer membrane of gram negatives and the uh, hexamethylene biguanide is going to also be a membrane perturbant as well. And so that is effectively going to go after the gram negatives and depending upon the detergent concentration in the disinfectant, um, and benza alconium is also in many contact lens solutions and in other things to disinfect on the fly. Speaking of, of contact lens solutions, Mike, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Atlanta for the APHL, uh, some association of public health laboratories meeting, right? And a person right. from the CDC gave a talk about a series of patients who had horrible pseudomonas infections. Some of them lost their eyes. They went into their lungs and bones, and it was all traced back to a bad batch of contact lens solution that was contaminated. Yep. Unbelievable yeah. that, you, that they would make contaminated stuff that people are putting in their eyes, right? Well, well just remember, it's, it's all about viable but non-culturable cells. You assay the lot, and what you routinely did is you would plate it on a petri dish, and many of these disinfectants are oxidants or oxidizers, and benzochlor benz benzochloramine that they were talking about is a quat. It's positively charged, mm. and quats don't actually cause all that much oxidative damage. But some of these other things, like the guanidine that he was talking about, is an oxidant. And it will effectively induce any of the microbes in the population. Normally, bacteria have about 0.3% of their population in a V, B, and C state. It's effectively the seed corn of the community. <laughs> but when you add these strong oxidants, anything like hydrogen peroxide or some of these perturbinants that we use to disinfect things, Right. It can send the V, B, and C concentration of that population from 0.3% all the way greater than 90%. And this, this we've talked about on TWIMS about, you know, the, the washed lettuces that we eat because the whole community is in a V, B, and C state. So when you plate it on a plate, nobody's going to grow. Yeah. And because it's below the limited detection. 
Yeah. And so you think it's safe, but it's not because it goes into your gut and it blooms because it's in a different neighborhood. And it says, I can live here. I couldn't so, live in that bottle of nonsense. And so, uh, so that's what's what the happens. Solution? What's the solution to this? Do we do PCR instead? The, no, there are, there are new assays um, based yeah. on C. elegans that if it do, kills the C. elegans, you know, you do take a little of the liquor from the lettuce, lettuce mm -hmm. wash eight and you feed it to the C. elegan worms. And if they die, then, you know, it, it's, it's uh, you got the bacteria there because the C. elegans will engulf the bacteria. And if they're virulent, and they're not food for the C. elegans, they of course end up dying. But that of course is more expensive. It takes a little bit longer. And of course the food safety industry is all based on viable counts. Michael, I believe you mentioned dental students earlier. What's the best material to use to eliminate bacteria in infected tooth pulp, such as in a root canal? They use bleach. You can use cold plasma too. Cold plasma is really great. It's, it's basically, you know, an arc. And if it's cold, it, it will just create a, a basically a, a series of free radicals in the free radicals. It's, it's really, if you think about it, bleach is the best disinfectant because it generates those free radicals, which will destroy the nucleic acid. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're ultimately going after. The other thing that free radicals do is it pokes holes in membranes. And the minute you destroy a membrane, whether it be virus or bacteria, the sucker's dead. Because, you know, if you destroy the membrane of virus, it's not going to be endocytosed properly. It's not going to deliver its payload properly. And similarly with bacteria, the minute you cut their membrane potential, they're dead. They can't generate anything. They can't bring anything in. And so, these membrane perturbinants um, often are going after uh, to short circuit the membrane. And so bleach really works. And the bleaches don't have to be sodium hypochlorite. They can be anything that generates free radicals. All right. Rainey says, could you talk about one, why we have no vaccine for dental caries and two, why silver diamine fluoride, a near cure for caries doesn't get used more? Well, I'll take the second one first. Silver diamine fluoride turns your teeth black. <laughs> and and unless you want to have black teeth, you don't use it. But many children who have uh, a large number of caries, silver diamine fluoride and CMS, the Center for Medicare Services, recently has allowed pediatricians of their Medicaid population to administer silver diamine fluoride to children, whereas before it was reserved just for the dental population. And CMS was very much concerned about the amount of caries in that at-risk population because it opens you up to all sorts of other unintended health consequences. As to why we don't have a vaccine for dental caries, it's the answer is because there's so many different streptococci uh, that can attach to the pellicle, uh, of our teeth. And you can sort of feel the pellicle of your tooth surface with your tongue. And if you do the experiment by not brushing your teeth, that pellicle and the biofilm on your tooth will actually grow. And you can say your teeth feel furry. And that's actually the biofilm and the streptococci expanding outwardly. Mm. And the reason we don't have a vaccine for dental caries is because there's so many different um, proteins in its outer surface that change the microbe spots so hmm. we don't have <laughs> antibodies against it. Plus, they have to be IgA antibodies. And as Vincent and Daniel and others have talked on about TWIV, you know, the best thing to protect us against, you know, these respiratory viruses is to have a high IgA level. And IgA, high IgA levels are hard vaccines to engineer. 
And so it's a, a bit of an engineering problem. It's a bit of antigenic complexity. And many people have tried to develop dental caries vaccines. Some have gotten close, but then we worry about the cross reactivity of the streptococcal antigens that happen to look similar to one of our cardiac myosin proteins. And that's of course how some folks are susceptible to a rheumatic disease, rheumatic heart disease, subsequent a streptococcal infection. I learned from the immune episode that, uh, you know, the mRNA vaccines, which are given intramuscularly, do not induce mucosal IgA, as you would guess, but infection yes. does. However, it is short lived. And uh, it's not clear how much local memory B cells you're getting there. So we need to do some work on that. I'm not sure we can get around that with a vaccine, but it's not it's not a bad thing to try, right? No. And, you know, we have to understand how to goose the production of IgA and whether that requires an adjuvant or class switching but that then opens Pandora's box because we're doing class switching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, does silver and copper have similar mechanisms against Pseudomonas and MRSA? Which one has the best efficacy in wound dressing? Uh, probably uh, copper would have the best activity because it's continuously active. Silver will get inactivated once it complexes with the sulfhydro groups. It, it reacts and silver will react with atmospheric oxygen. Anyone who's polished their mother's silver at Thanksgiving knows that it tarnishes. And once the silver AG plus is tarnished, it's no longer antimicrobial. So copper just continuously works irrespective of what it looks like, whether it's green, whether it's red, whether it's shiny copper colored, it works irrespective of its oxidation state. Richard says, so if I eat a little piece of cat every day, will my cat allergy go away? <laughs> no, you don't need to eat it. You could, if it's to fur or dander, you could, you know, they would give you injections of that injections just. Uh, intradermally under the skin <laughs> under the skin subdermal yeah you don't have to eat it no don't eat your cat no yeah. <laughs> if you're interested it's it's all about the dendritic cells and antigenic presentation and that's pandora's box for me you know dendritic cells and antigenic presentation and how you become allergic versus immune against it, it it's really quite remarkable how our immune system works what are the best small molecules to inhibit quorum sensing? <laughs> Ones that destroy the homoserine lactones or the short peptides. So proteases would be good, uh, but again, they have to be specific. And any of the homoserine lactone scavengers, and if you look at the structure of a homoserine lactone, you're going to say that's going to break easily. And, um, you know, that's part of the magic of quorum sensing is, you know, the bacterium throws these things out into the medium and said, you all come back when there's enough of you. And they're banking on the fact that if there's not enough of them, they'll never come back yeah. and they'll never waste their energy making genes they don't need turned on. And so there's Bonnie Basler has been doing a lot of work on looking at how to inhibit quorum sensing. And Bonnie, of course, is at Princeton. And she's been looking at quorum sensing and uh, Pete Greenberg has looked at quorum sensing as well as, you know, the pioneer in the field was Barbara Glusky. What are the news on nasal sprays for COVID? Well, as we said, they're working on them and uh, it's not going to be a trivial thing. And part of the issue now is that they're not going to be for this pandemic because it's almost over and we're not nobody's going to invest in new vaccines because they're not going to be used all that much. Right. But for the next one, I think that's where well, the question is, can you block the receptor? And the problem is, is the ACE2 receptor is everywhere. You, no, but these vaccines would have to, 
Uh, they would oh, they're going to go IGA. target. They're going to target something else. That, okay. I would say they have to induce IgA, like we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, blocking with a small molecule. I think that's not going to happen. I don't. I don't think that's going to happen because anything you do is going to be transient, and uh, I don't know how lo- long that's going to last. Right? This is pretty funny. And what bef- we? Go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Well, is anyone smelling behind their ear? I hope yeah, that's so. Pretty funny. Because that's pretty funny. It, it'll it'll teach you a lot, but. I, I think, you know, as we begin to go down these rabbit holes, I think as we begin to understand the infectious process, we'll get better at trying to figure out how to block infections. And what infection control has taught us, something has to be continuously active in order to make a population effect. You may be mm-hmm. able to prevent an infection in one or two if you've applied it at the right moment in time, but if you're not applying it at the right moment in time, the, the virus or the bacterium will get in. And so it has to, that's what copper taught us. It has to be continuously active. And to the best of my knowledge is there's nothing out there that's continuously active. Even our poor immune system complement requires activation in order to do its dirty deed. And we're going to talk a little bit about compliment and its evil empire tomorrow on TWIM. Michael, why so are stay some... stay tuned for the episode. Yep. Why are some bacteria species more sensitive to freeze-thaw cycles? It's they don't have enough spanks. They, 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 um, because of the amount of water, and remember when water freezes, it induces ice crystallization and if they can pierce the peptidoglycan they can pierce the membrane and if there's enough hydrophilic proteins in the membrane and those water filled channels they'll freeze and then they'll thaw and then they'll have a gaping hole and so it it's really dependent upon who's in the membrane and how many are hydrophilic And whether or not that freezing, it's got the hydrophilic molecule in there. It's like making an Mm -hmm. ice cube and not all ice is crystal clear. I mean, you just look at the ice in your freezer and it's continuously undergoing freeze thaw cycles because most Americans have a frost free freezer. And that's how our freezers stay frost free. They go through thaw cycles. Is parafilm or autoclave tape better to seal in moisture in Petri dishes? <laughs> uh, parafilm breathes. It, it, it slows it, it down. It slows it down. Autoclave tape is probably a little better because it's stickier, but it's not as wide as parafilm. Right. And parafilm's fun to play with. Parafilm is great. Uh, I don't know the answer to this one. Maybe Michael does. It, there seems to be an assumption that exoplanets all have similar element composition to Earth. Why would that be true? It's, again, this is planetary science and how planets formed. And Earth science was a long time ago for me. So I refer you to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Indeed. I think they could do spectroscopy right remotely. And they they do. They do induce there. spectroscopy. Yeah. Uh, Thomas says, as I said during the last Q&A, chemistry is queen and mathematics is king. I think Michael would agree. But microbes rule the world. (laughs) They do rule. They do. Uh, So Emily says, I love calling it dirt, even as an avid gardener, but most gardeners and farmers say it's soil. Huh. They've been trained by the agronomist. Soil is living dirt. Dirt needs worms, yes. bacteria, fungi, etc., to grow really good beans and tomatoes. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. I planted my tomatoes last week. Hopefully they will grow and won't get hit by frost. Is that right? Uh, oh, yeah. yes. Well, here they would have been hit by frost last night. Yes. Michael, uh, Lori says, I wonder... If prehistoric man during the Bronze Age figured out that copper had antimicrobial properties. I think you've talked about this before, right? Yeah, I did. And it wasn't prehistoric man. It was prehistoric woman. Uh, Women were the first scientists and they did this experiment. 
and everyone can diagnose diarrhea because we all know it when we see it. And the women appreciated that when they drew their water from a well or a river or a lake, and they stored it in a copper vessel from morning until night, their family had less incidence of diarrhea than families who just drank straight water out of either earthenware or not using the copper jugs. And so, you know, the antimicrobial activity of copper goes back for millennia. Uh, they, they trace it back for at least 8,000 years. And it was attributed to women who were tasked with water gathering and maintaining the water stores of the house. So we, we owe our understanding of antimicrobial properties to not only Mother Earth, but Mother herself, who, who taught us that um, mm. you don't want diarrhea. I don't know if you remember when I came back from Sweden, I had a, taken a picture of the first bone repair. Yes, and they had they had wrapped it in copper. Remember? Yes, because they already well the knew. Egyptians the Egyptians of course had um, uh, malachite. Malachite green is what the Egyptians used to treat fungal infections. And that's probably where it came from. So they figured it out. And in fact, in the Phoenician wars, the Fe ancient Phoenicians would often sharpen the edge of their bronze sword into their battle wounds to prevent gangrene from occurring. Wow. Well, yeah. It's, it's worth doing if you're going to prevent gangrene. <laughs> well, right? you, you want to keep your limbs. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, SRR, for your support of science uh, communication. Um, Silent Runner says copper is used in anti-fouling paint for ships. It indeed it is. And it really, really works. Those yeah. barnacles don't like it all that much. <laughs> uh, John, thank you for your contribution. Michael, you have a great teaching energy and it's a great match for office hours. Well, thank you. And Sebastian wants to know, what's the current state of phage therapy? Do we even know much about the metavirome? Are there efforts towards harnessing, designing phages against pathogens? There are indeed efforts towards designing phages against pathogens. Uh, I spent about seven years of my life trying to do that, and we ran out of money. And even though we were able to demonstrate first principles that it does indeed work, but I think the challenges of making it into an ethical pharmaceutical where you can go and pick it up are many because uh, there are many, the phage has been designed to avoid our immune system and avoid the, the, um, the bacteria, of course, become, if you will, immune to phages simply by uh, learning their tricks and... Uh, We've learned a lot of uh, genetics from phages uh, of how they adapt to bacteria. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to be challenging. Um, we've, we understand how to dose them, but most of phage therapy relies on an exponential of, uh, expansion of the drug where you require the infection to manufacture more phage. And it, it becomes an issue in limiting dilution because as you manufacture, you kill off more bacteria, mm -hmm. even though you have a lot of phage. But if there's an occult center of bacteria hidden that don't actually see the phage, then... Mm -hmm. The phage will go away and then the bacteria will come back and the infection will reoccur. So you have to give enough phage in order to saturate the host, which is really pretty hard to do because you have to get into all the interstitial fluid. Yeah. And we, we know how the volume of the blood, but trying to deliver enough phage at the right concentration to hit simultaneously before the bacteria adapt and change their spots so the phage can still find a receptor is going to be our biggest challenge. Uh, for C. diff, 
uh, there has been a lot of progress on understanding uh, C. diff. And in fact, we now understand that um, in C. diff infections, the antibiotics that we use to treat the C. diff often kill the bacteria in our colon that are responsible for the metabolism of bile. Hmm. And bile is an inducer of C. difficile to come out of the spore state into the vegetative state. So by virtue of the fact that we give an antibiotic to kill the bacterium that's making the toxin, we also kill the other bacteria that are responsible for degrading bile. That's actually the inducer of the spores that are refractory to the antimicrobial because they're just sitting there. And so it's this tour de force of when do you stop the antibiotics so that the bio state will return. And that's what stool transplants are all about. And they're trying to, you know, figure out when to cut off the antibiotics that they gave to sterilize your gut and then allow your normal flora to restore itself from the colon before the toxin, uh, the toxin and the C. diff begins to take over. So <laughs> I think we're going to have to learn from, we have to understand the biology and the ecology of the situation and understanding that bile is actually an inducer to go out of spore state into vegetative state, which then makes more toxin, as well as understanding the metavirome, which we haven't done. We, we've we talked a lot about the microbiome on TWIM, but we haven't talked about the virome of the bacteria of the microbiome. That's right. And that's, that's right. got to be done. So I'm looking for papers like that all the time. Armenon, thank you for your support of science uh, education. You got a super sticker. Kang says, is there a relationship between post-nasal drip and pneumonia? Yes, in fact, there is. It's thought that this will let, let viruses down into the lower tract, especially when you're sleeping, right? It's a way for it to, to slip down there. Um, let's see now. We're getting towards the end here, so let's uh, see what other pressing questions we have here. Uh, I've had hep B vaccination five times. I never developed antibodies. Well, you may be a non-responder. Non-responder or the test may not be. If it's the same lab doing the same test over and over, maybe there's something off with it. But you're likely a non-responder, and, and that happens. We know that happens. Okay, let's see what else here. Do kids who got the earliest chickenpox vac needs shingles? So the, the early, the current chickenpox vaccine is uh, attenuated. It's Live infectious. attenuated. So it can lead to some shingles, but lower uh, incidence than natural infection. Um, but um, I you don't probably know. need, and I don't think the data are out yet because yeah, most yeah. most people who are getting the shingles vaccine were exposed to chickenpox, and that's and right. now it's and now we have a generation that has gotten the, the live attenuated chickenpox vaccine, and we don't know what actually sets shingles off. We don't know if it's a stressor or some other viral infection or just immune senescence yeah. that sets it off. So I, I, I know they're thinking of replacing the, the childhood um, chickenpox vaccine with the, the current shingles vaccine because it's really good and it's a non-infectious vaccine. It will not cause shingles later in life, but the trials have to be done in kids first. Yeah, right. to see whether or not they develop chickenpox uh, and that, you know, there's still enough chickenpox <clears throat> running around. Uh, let's see. Nancy says, the Human Genome Project, Where did it, when did it begin? Well, where did it begin and what year? It was 1990 and it went till 2003. And yes, that first genome was done. Uh, and since then, so that cost billion, uh, many billions billions dollars. Billions of dollars. 
And now you can do the genome, and it took that many years, and now you can do a human genome in one day for $1,500 or probably less. No, it's dropped to 100 bucks. 100 bucks. I got It's dropped to 100 lecture. bucks. It's That's dropped amazing. to 100 bucks. And I actually know the story of when um, Francis Collins went into the Oval Office to pitch the Human Genome Project to George Bush. Uh, mm -hmm. I heard the story from uh, one, a mentor of mine um, who worked in the Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy at the White House. And uh, she identified the funding that funded the initial Human Genome Project. And she ushered uh, Dr. Collins into the Oval Office to meet the president. And uh, <laughs> she regaled the story of... This, this was, I guess, the first time Dr. Collins was in the Oval, and she described how everyone who enters the Oval Office for their first time for a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the President of the United States sort of gets a little shell-shocked, and he was sure. no different. Sure, of course. And I so, would. yes. All right, folks, that's it. It's 10 p.m. It's time to wrap up this office hours. I want to thank our moderators tonight. Let's see, we had everybody here. Frank wasn't here. We had Les. We had Vanity Nutrition. We had Steph. We had Barb Mac UK. We had um, the young guy. What the heck is his name? Uh, PDK. Who did I forget? Tom was here. Thank you all for, uh, and Andrew, and there we go. We got a lot of moderators. How cool is that? Thank you all for your time. We appreciate it. It's uh, two hours in the middle of the week, keeping things civilized here. Thanks everybody for coming to this uh, office hours. As, as Andrew said, it's a Twix mashup. Come back it next is. week. It'll be, uh, let's see, what's next week? It's, I think it's just me next week. Sorry about that, folks. We'll have to get Mike. Um, we'll have to get Michael back in the future, and I'll be we will have to get. Um, we have to get uh, Daniel Griffin back as well. It's about time to get uh, Daniel back, and I want to thank uh, everybody for coming. And oh, thank you all for thank, sharing your good questions. Uh, and Michael, thank you for coming. I appreciate your time, and uh, I know you've oh, got a been, busy week. It has been a lot of fun. And, of course, tomorrow I will see you at 2 p.m. Eastern for TWIM. Yes, right, we're going to record, record an episode tomorrow. Look for it, and I don't know how far Ray is behind or if he's all caught up. I think he's all caught up. Um, so I'll probably go up next week. I'm not sure if he's got one more to edit. There might be one more. I'm, uh, yeah, he's one more to edit, the last one we did. Yeah. Okay. Okay, folks, in the meanwhile, we'll be back next week, Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. Until then, folks, please stay safe and have a great week. Good night. Good night, everyone.